Imagine a lumpy, bumpy rock about the size of a potato. Inside it are some of the most sought after metals on Earth. We are very lucky today with our location because we are here in the Natural History Museum in London, which is just a fabulous place, this cathedral to the natural world. And there are so many exciting things in all the nooks and crannies of that, but we are not here to look at all of those. We are here to go down where that used to live, down into the deep sea. The energy transition is an enormous undertaking. We're talking about rebuilding our way of extracting our most critical resource, energy, in just a couple of decades. And one thing we do know is it's going to involve a lot more stuff, motors, wind turbines, el electronics, and especially batteries. And all of that is going to involve metals like copper and cobalt and nickel. And that's all got to come from somewhere. We know that land mining can be really damaging, wouldn't it be lovely if all of this was just, you know, sitting around somewhere for us to take? Well, this is a polymetallic nodule from five kilometres down on the deep sea floor. It's stuffed full of valuable metals and there are hundreds of tonnes of these just hanging around in the deep ocean. So people are starting to ask the question, is this what we're going to build a clean energy future from? But it's not just a case of whether we could, but whether we should because these great areas of the deep sea floor are some of our last great wildernesses. Anything that lives down there in that weird environment is probably the closest thing to alien life we'll ever see. And any other time we've trashed a wilderness, we've regretted it. So when it comes to deep sea mining, are the trade-offs worth it? What do we lose and what do we gain? Like fully charged? You'll love our fun-packed Everything Electric Expos around the world. Come and join us in Harrogate, Farnborough and Vancouver. Remember, energy and transport professionals go for free. You've probably heard the statistic that 70% of Earth's surface is covered by the deep sea and that's a lot but the sea is also really deep and just to get an idea for what how deep it really is imagine looking up at an aircraft at cruising altitude which is about 10 kilometers up and that's like looking from the very very deepest parts of the ocean all the way up to the surface about 10 kilometers most of the ocean is on average a little under half that deep but that is still a lot of water and so down in those inactive accessible depths, there are three places where you get metal deposits. There are cobalt-rich ores that you get on the tops of seamounts, which are like underwater mountains. There are sulphide-rich ores that you get near hydrothermal vents. And then there are the polymetallic nodules that you find on the deep abyssal plains. And they're mostly made of four elements, manganese, copper, cobalt and nickel. And so you can see why people are interested in them. These are found in the Central Pacific Ocean first. Heavy. Yeah, quite heavy, um, in 1870s. So the HMS Challenger, which was one of the first sort of global oceanographic voyages, it went around the world, it's a bit crumbly. Right. They don't worry about it, they do kind of crumble slightly. Um, don't want to be start, responsible for crumbling your collection. Started uh, sampling um, in these very, very deep parts of our ocean. You know, actually, they were kind of looking for life. You know, is life persistent in the very greatest depths of the ocean? When they got to the Central Pacific, uh, they found these amazing kind of. There's some of them are sort of really round. Some of them are kind of more discoidal, sort of shape. Uh, these these lumps of metal just sitting on the seabed, and they came up in the dredges. They didn't have obviously imagery or video or film or anything in those days, uh, but they got brought up buckets and bucket loads of these things, and they got terribly excited about them, and actually did a bit of research and discovered they are relatively high metal content. So most of what that is is a uh, iron and manganese oxide. And then there's 1 to 2% nickel and cobalt in there as well, which is obviously what's interest for, for battery metals. So this, the depth that these things form at, so how do they, I mean, what, what depth, what so you depth can see, do these come uh, from? So this is from uh, 5,000 metres in the Central Pacific Ocean. And it's you sitting, it's so sitting on the seabed like that. This is the surface is exposed to seawater. Okay. Uh, and they grow um, in the seawater. So these little, like, kind of almost like cauliflower sort of growth here. It's just minerals accreting over millions of years from seawater. And then the sediments, because soupy sediment, the seawater in the sediment as well, and the minerals accrete on this side as well, in the mud. So you get kind of growth upwards and growth downwards. 
And for some bizarre reason, they, they, they form and they don't get buried. Obviously, everywhere in the world's oceans, you know, there's a slow rain of organic material. There's what we call marine snow from the surface layers. There's a few sweet spots on the world's oceans where there's enough material coming down that the nodules can form. There's enough metals in the water mm -hmm. that they can accrete, but it's not so fast that it buries the nodule. And that, how old is this one? Do you estimate? I mean, obviously they, it's hard for you to know um, exactly, but how old do you think that might be? What, what you generally read, this is what the geochemists tell us, you know, I'm a biologist, not a chemist, but they grow at one to two millimetres per million years. So that is one to one millimetre so thicker could be, every million years? Yes. I th it, we think in some places it's quite a bit faster than that. But this is several million years, maybe t tens of millions of years old. So, should we mine the deep sea or not? Well, that all depends on what's living down there and what the impacts of mining would be. Well, when people start first going there, of course, even now, we had a research cruise there last uh, February, and we got down to the sea floor, and sometimes you can be forgiven for thinking, oh, there's nothing here. You know, just land, and you just see nodules, and you see mud. Um, in terms of large animals, it takes a little time to find any. Uh, you drive along for a little while, and suddenly, pop, you know, out pops a sea cucumber, right. a purple <laughs> sea cucumber. I've got one right here. Yeah, this is... Um, you. It, it's the actually amazing colour. Um, these are the sort of... We yeah, call them the like... megafauna, yeah. They're, they're sort of like the wildebeest, if you like, of the abyssal plain. You know, <laughs> they, they kind of cruise it's very along. It's wobbly, isn't it? It sort of wobbles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they look more spectacular when they're alive, I have to say. But they, they cruise along the seabed, uh, hoovering up um, marine snow, you know, this organic right. material that's fallen from I the surface layers. No, that's right. Um, so they're there. So sea cucumbers are sort of a classic. There's a big one there. But then, of course, you've got these rather amazing things, um, the sponges. So these will actually sit growing on the nodules. So after a few minutes of driving along in your submarine or remotely operated mini submarine, you'll see these sorts of things. Little, like they look like sort of ping pong balls on sticks. <laughs> right, so that's it's quite a good one like there. So it's looking like a lollipop then. Exactly. Yeah. There's a taller one there. Um, these are glass sponges. So they have these glass stalks, and they manage to kind of figure out a way of growing. This one was actually attached to a nodule, growing. It's, a, it's that that tall above the seabed and their filter feeder, so they just sit there feeding on organic material that's going past. Some of them are carnivorous, so they might eat small shrimps or tiny little things that are in the water. Um, so those are the sort of two of your quite common things, but that's not really where most of the biodiversity is. So actually it's in the small fauna, in the little tiny animals that are living in the sediment. You can only see really with microscopes. And it was only in the sort of late, late 1970s uh, when scientists particularly led out Scripps Oceanographic Institute, Bob Hessler, who's a famous sort of founder of doing this work on the small invertebrates, uh, started you know, sorting painstakingly quantitative samples from the seabed of the Pacific and said, hang on a minute, there's actually surprisingly high biodiversity in the mud, you know, living in, in amongst the nodules and some of them on the nodules of things like polychaetes. This is marine segmented worms. You've got little crustacea, which is not many shrimps, but things like amphipods and isopods, like the wood lice that you find like, under stones in your garden. But it is hard to know exactly what we're going to need and how much of it. So, for example, people talk a lot about cobalt, but the big battery manufacturers are putting an enormous amount of effort into just designing cobalt out of batteries. And at the start of 2022, half of the, of the cars that Tesla made were, used lithium iron phosphate batteries, which are completely cobalt free. So it's not clear exactly what we're going to need, but we are going to need something. And we know that mining causes enormous damage on land. So people are looking at the ocean and seeing economic potential. When it comes to the potential impacts of deep sea mining, what do we know about that? Because, you know, it's a long way away, it's hard to study. What, what, what sorts of things do we know about what deep sea mining might do? Well, sort of less than you might think. And of course, one of the, it's, it's been, for a long time, it's been a bit of a chicken and the egg thing. You know, in a sense, we, we don't, won't know what the impacts of deep sea mining are until some sort of deep sea mining actually happens. Because there's two parts to this. There's one is what's the baseline biodiversity and environmental of the environment, and we know a reasonable amount now about the area, of the the, the, the clarion clipperton zone, this area which is of the, the greatest commercial interest. You know, I can roughly tell you how many animals there are per square meter. We know roughly how many species there are, although we haven't described most of them. You know, about about 80% of them will be undescribed, but we do know roughly how many there probably are. 
Uh, the things we don't know is how they would respond to disturbance and impact, you know, and that's where we can just hypothesize. Um, but can so we look at, you know, because people I think in the 70s, you know, they sort of had a go. Is it possible to go back to those sites and see what, you know, 50 yes. years later, what do they look like? For a long time, you know, we, we haven't really understood the, sort of the long term impacts either. The problem with that study, so the early 1970s, of course, there wasn't any pre impact. Um, so they didn't measure it before? No, no, okay. this is like also part know. of the problem. I mean, this is a very, very common issue in deep water sort of exploration. People don't collect good baseline data. I mean, a classic example is the deep water horizon. You know, you'd think in the Gulf of Mexico they would have had really good information on the seafloor communities around the, the wellheads, uh, but they didn't. You know, so of course it was very hard to say whether what the impact of that oil right. spill was, you know, afterwards because you didn't have any information from the before time. So we're still learning basically what yeah. what the impacts um, are. What sorts of things? I mean, obviously, if you're a you're a glass sponge and you live on a nodule and someone takes your nodule away, you've got a problem. That's but right. Yeah, what, yeah. Are there are there other impacts, potential impacts as well? So obviously, there's the area that's mined. So the nodules. Well, some of the nodules are removed. I mean, most of what you can sort of see is these with these mining tests. They don't remove all the nodules. They just get rid of some of them because they're not perfectly efficient. So some nodules are removed, and obviously the sediments compacted. And there's some degree of dis like significant amount of disturbance, obviously, in the sediment. Uh, and then there's a plume of sediment around it. But actually, I mean, I don't, that's not a secret, is that that settles out quite close. So, yeah, the plume impact was originally hypothesized to be a very significant worry. But that's now, certainly from the scientific data that I've seen, is, is constrained much more. So this is the idea um, that when you kind of dig it up, you sort of kick up a cloud yeah, of bits and bits. That's right, which and might spread in the ocean current. float off sideways. I think it's yeah. the current's very low down there, so it just tends to just settle out around the machine. Um, of course, the area of seabed of, of, that would be mined is also a factor, right? So you know, you've got 21 contractors out there. Each one has 75,000 square kilometers. Or, this is a very rough numbers. But let's say about 70,000 square kilometers each. You know, this is a very large area. Um, so within that, then, you know, in order to make a, an effective estimate of impact, we need to know how many of those will actually take place, so they're just kind of placeholders. Uh, and then within those contract areas, how much are actually going to mine? If you look at the, sort of, I mean, it's what, quite interesting, I've only learned this recently, where in the German contract area, they all have nation states behind them, it's quite sort of bizarre kind of geopolitics of the clarion Clipton zone. We call it the BGR because that's the German ministry, which is responsible for resources for Germany. But in their area, they've estimated it's about only about 30% of the region that they have is, is mineable, um, which is quite a high, but for me, I just assumed that most of it was. So what, what's, what's, why isn't the it's, rest it's of It's rocky mineable? outcrops, seamounts, uh, air slopes, which are not suitable, you know, just too steep. So it's just inconvenient, basically. Inconvenient, yeah. So, uh, so that, the, all of those sorts of numbers, and until you sort of know all of that, and that will have to come out in the... A contractor at the moment, I mean, still, the regulations are still not signed off, but to go from this sort of exploration phase, which is not like destructive at all, we're just looking around, to exploitation, which is obviously when the impact really comes, they have to basically state all of that. This is the area we will mine, this is the area we will leave to set aside, uh, this is, you know, what we think the impacts will be, etc., etc. The biggest deposits of polymetallic nodules are in the clarion clipperton zone, which is an area of the eastern Pacific that's around four to five kilometres deep, and it's a huge area. And so there is a huge amount of metal down there. It's estimated that just in that one patch, there are 44 million tonnes of cobalt, which is three times more than all the known land reserves. But because this is an area beyond national jurisdiction, it's not individual countries that get to decide what happens there. It's a committee called the International Seabed Authority. The International Seabed Authority was set up in 1982 to regulate mineral extraction from the seabed on the basis that those huge areas are the common heritage of all mankind. And it is sometimes criticised because it was set up to organise mining rather than to say whether or not it should happen. But still, that's the committee that writes the rules. And up till now, it's granted about 20 licences for exploration. So that's just having a look to see what's there. But no licences so far for extraction. That's the commercial mining. But that might be about to change, because in 2021, the small Pacific island of Nauru triggered a process that could force the ISA to formalise its procedures and start accepting applications for commercial mining. But there is a lot of opposition. 
Countries like France and Canada, Switzerland and New Zealand are opposed to any mining and companies like Google, Volvo, Samsung and BMW have committed not to use any metals produced in this way. But there's a few things that I think about, you know, that kind of bother me with all of this. And one of them is that I'm not sure we need deep sea metals because companies are going to huge amounts of effort to design out things like cobalt, for example. So if we need less of them, then maybe we can have a clean energy future and leave the deep sea alone and, and get the best of both worlds. And then it's also true that mining in the ocean doesn't stop mining on land. It just means you've got both of them. And then finally, there are lots of problems with mining on land. You know, there's a huge amount of damage to both the environment and to people. But the thing about mining on land is it's possible to see what's happening. You know, there are satellite images. You can get in a plane and go there and look at what's happening. There's some measure of accountability. But down in the deep sea, it's almost impossible to keep track. So if you don't like the way activities are being done on land, it's not really clear you can trust the way they're being done deep in the ocean where nobody is looking. And I think that's quite a big consideration. But at the moment, there's a, a, a stipulation written in the rules that do exist, although some more regulations might be on the way, that says that this is the common heritage of all mankind and that it shouldn't generate damage so we have to know what serious we, harm is the serious worst. harm yeah. so we so we don't know basically what serious harm no. might be caused well no one's defined what serious harm is you know that's this is a legal question right. which I've, i'll leave that to somebody else i mean i have no idea what that means as a scientist obviously you know this is a big societal decision you know you need to weigh up the economics the social angles the legal angles everything else and the financial one you know one of the original the law of the sea treaty was set up to try to redistribute wealth actually right. yeah, interesting enough you sort of forget yeah. that the whole that was kind of one of the main goals of it. It was not about protecting the environment, it's about here's wealth, we're going to make it evenly available for right. them. So they sort of, socialist sort of principles came out in the 1970s. And then, you know, you're, 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 you have this environmental question, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what those impacts would be. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, you know, a significant part of it. And so what, I mean, one of the things that we, people who don't know anything about the deep sea, who haven't seen all these wonderful beasties, might sort of think, well, you know, it's cold and dark down there, what do we lose? You know, so, so say we, we dig up some nodules, then we have nodules, and when we kill some biology, what do we lose if we lose this wilderness? What's yeah. your perspective on that as a, yeah. someone who studies it? Well, I remember, uh, I remember when I was doing GCSE geography, I had to, like, this is, a, you know, the exams that we do in England when you're 16 years old, and you always had to list five advantages of the Aswan Dam and five disadvantages of the Aswan Dam. And I could never forget, like, you memorise them in order to pass your exam. Right. And, and it's the same nowadays. You know, essentially, we have to come up with the advantages and the disadvantages. And scientists, you know, our role is to, is to provide input to that process, provide evidence. You know, this is the types of impacts you'll see. This is the animals that live there, et cetera. And that has to be weighed up against the sort of broader societal decisions, really. Um, and, you know, it's a challenge. You know, I... I, I you know, obviously, you know, we don't know, you know, exactly where it's going to go, uh, but ultimately someone will have to make a decision and it, it, it will be, you know, a political decision in the end. You know, this is weighing up the advantages of getting your cobalt and nickel from the seabed versus getting it from some other source. Uh, we know that, you know, these nickel mines and cobalt mines are opening all the time in terrestrial environments, so that will be, the, the, the decisions will be weighed against that, but it won't be sort of purely, I doubt very much, it will be purely an environmental decision. Right. based also, I'm sure, on economics Trade and all over geopolitics and all sorts of things. So for me personally, I am not convinced that we have enough information to make this decision yet. And it is an irreversible decision. Maybe when all the economics and the geopolitics and the climate change is taken into account, maybe this will turn out to be the least worst option, but I definitely don't think it's a good option. I'd quite like those deep sea worms to continue to look out into the darkness undisturbed. And that's it for this episode. Please do like and subscribe to both the Fully Charged channel and the Everything Electric channel. And if you have been, thank you for watching.